We are very um, pleased and honored to have tonight with us uh, Nikita Reed, uh, who's a distinguished alumna of the, uh, of the Weitzman School of Design. Um, welcome, Nikita. How are you this evening? Good. Thank you, Randy. I am great, and it's exciting to be back. It's kind of wild, actually, but thanks for having me. Great, thanks. So um, we have to, we're, we're all back, uh, and you know, in in Meyerson Hall, in uh, with air quotes, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> one of the one of the pleasures of um, of the Zoom life these days is that we can organize these events, um, notwithstanding the super busy schedules of some of the folks that we want to be in dialogue with. So we're uh, we're really grateful to uh, to have a bit of your time this evening. Uh, so uh, before we get started, uh, people are, are still um, signing in. I did want to just uh, remind everyone that we, we welcome um, all of your questions. Uh, we will certainly leave time at the end of this evening for to entertain um, your questions, um, as well as the questions that come up between Nikita and me during the dialogue. Uh, what we'd like you to do is to click the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of Zoom and add your questions there as they occur to you. Um, do them anytime. You don't have to wait for the end. Uh, and we will um, uh, look forward to getting to those uh, in, in a few minutes. So um, I, I'll uh, give just a really uh, quick few facts um, to introduce Nikita to those of you who are not already familiar with her. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll just get started with uh, some informal conversation. Uh, Nikita also um, happily has some slides uh, to talk about some of her um, uh, more uh, amazing projects, uh, then, and we'll have a chance to talk about those as well in good time. So uh, uh, Nikita, of course, we met uh, about probably more than 10 years ago now uh, when you were a student at, uh, at Penn Design, um, pre-Weitzman School of Design, um, where you studied both architecture and historic preservation. Um, since then, you've uh, been doing working in a number of different firms, which I'll let you um, talk about. Um, one of the things that I think is really, um, uh, you know, kind of amazing and laudable and uh, a model for, for other young professionals is that you've been really involved in practice. You've also been uh, involved in a number of different kinds of projects and in, uh, in serving your community and your field through, um, you know, serving on boards, serving on councils, um, uh, you know, uh, in just an, any number of ways, um, a long list of them in your CV. Uh, so I think that's that's I think an important part of the the kind of unpaid work that we all have to to uh, kind of recognize and, and honor in each other. Um, and you certainly have a, a long and growing list of those those uh, points of service. Um, so your current uh, gig, uh, Nikita's current gig, uh, is with uh, with Quinn Evans, uh, a firm uh, based in uh, D.C. and Ann Arbor. Um, and uh, and just to to start off, let me. Ask you, Nikita, just to talk about a bit of the, your arc, uh, maybe like getting to Penn and getting through Penn, and then all the things you've been doing after Penn, and just uh, just kind of give give us uh, give us the the story. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks again for having me. So it's been uh, it's been a journey, and it's wild that it's been eleven years since I graduated from Penn. I graduated in two thousand ten, um, and so before that, I did my undergraduate in architecture at UVA. Um, and I had always had a fascination with existing and mainly dilapidated buildings. When I was younger, I didn't know that, you know, what historic buildings meant and that sort of thing. I just thought of vacant and dilapidated buildings. Um, and so then I went to architecture school thinking I was going to learn all about that there. That was not the case. Um, and I had worked for um, a former mentor in DC. And so he was a preservation architect, um, got more interested in it, decided to go back to grad school for preservation. So I actually started with preservation at Penn. I uh, did a solid year of preservation there and then applied to the architecture program, got in the architecture program. Um, and it was interesting because my pen cohort, so my preservation cohort was very much like, oh, architects can't design things. Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings leaked. Uh, and then my uh, pen architecture cohort was like, oh, preservationists just get in the way. What are they doing? Holding up progress. And so it always was weird to me because it's like preservationists need architects and architects need preservationists. Um, I mean, I would hope that architects are designing things that they would want preservationists to preserve in 50 years. Um, and preservationists, you know, architects give us some job security. Um, but it was also, it was an interesting to see um, both cohorts having a either or as opposed to a both and mentality, which is kind of how architecture and preservation have always been for me. 
Uh, so after Penn, I uh, moved down to Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, where my uh, fiance, now husband, went to uh, grad school down there. Uh, and I had the privilege to work at AECOM in Roanoke, Virginia, which was very um, different from Philadelphia. Um, in, in case you guys, are, <laughs> in case you don't know, Brown Oak is a little bit more, um, a little more southern, a little more country. Um, even though I am from Virginia, uh, I'm from Northern Virginia. A lot of my coworkers would be like, "Oh, well, you're, you're a Northerner, right?" And it's like, "No, nope, still a Virginian, just Northern Virginia." Um, but it was fascinating being there, and I learned a lot from my coworkers, particularly about um, farming, because a lot of my coworkers owned cattle. So it was an interesting kind of mix of professionals who also were in ranching. So it was cool to learn about that. Um, so fast forward a couple of years, uh, had some personal tragedy. So I ended up moving back up to the DC area um, and realized that I need, I could, you know, it was, I was like, I could die at any time. So I need to start my own firm. I need to do what I want to do. Um, so I, again, coordinated and uh, collaborated with a former mentor. We started a business together. Uh, did that for about seven years, um, and then had this great opportunity with Quinn Evans to be able to uh, work out of the Baltimore office, um, which was a, their legacy, uh, Chobin Holbeck, which was a firm that they, Quinn Evans had acquired, and, you know, that firm was just amazing, and I'd been fangirling that firm for a while, so I was like, you know, it's too, much, it's too good of an opportunity to pass up, so I've, I've been very grateful to be there. Um, and so along the way, kind of within that trajectory, I, as you mentioned, I ended up volunteering on a lot of different boards, being on councils, because as a young person getting started, particularly as a business owner, uh, a, a great way to get your name out there and meet more people in the field is to really volunteer your time, go to boards, go and kind of network. The awkwardness that everyone hates to do, but is such a necessity in the business world. Um, so I just... I, with enough practice, I really started to enjoy networking. Um, I hung out with a lot of 63 year olds often. That was kind of, a, I was often the youngest person in the room by decades. Um, but it was just great to be able to learn how to just talk to any and everyone. Um, and so it, between the work that I've been doing, kind of the technical work, as well as the people work of talking to people of all sorts of different backgrounds and, um, just realizing that we all have a lot more in common than uh, differences. It's been, it's been fun. It's been interesting how the trajectory has gone because when I graduated from Penn, I, this was not planned. Like this is not like I had a 10 year master plan. This is where I know exactly I'll be. It's been a, um, a windy road. I'll put it that way. <laughs> well, uh, uh, maybe windy, but I think inspirational. So I think, you know, I, I hope and trust that the students who are, who are listening in and watching in or who will watch the recording later on will, will be taking notes and, uh, and, uh, and, and following, you know, following some of your leads and, and learning from some, some of the, the, you know, the decisions that you've had to make. I did want to go back to, um, uh, to ask one question about something you said about um, that came out of your time at Penn, mm -hmm. and I think as a, as a question for for many of us who work in architecture or preservation, or certainly uh, in the in the the you know the part of the Venn diagram where they're overlapping, right. you know th that that kind of either or attitude um, is is I think something we all have some insight on. Um, your work over the last number of years really centered on sustainability and sustainable design, which you know I think they're they're very compelling arguments that that is, is a, a subject where neither architects nor preservationists have exclusive right. domain, right? It's, it's we really need to work together and actually bring other people into the, mm -hmm. the professional mix. So do you feel like the, the, um, the pursuit of sustainability in more and more ways has changed at all, that attitude of either or? Yeah. And so I think it's evolved. So um, let's see, when I got started, so when I became a lead AP back in like 2006, sustain sustainability within the profession of architecture was still seen as this annoying other that we had to add on to the project that was gonna cost so much more money that no one wanted, that was just a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. um, but really it's one of those things where that mindset has shifted. So it's becoming much more of an integral way that designers are thinking and realizing that we need to be sustainable from the outset. So we actually pay attention to the effects that our buildings have and really take a bigger picture in mind with how our designs are gonna impact the built environment, the people that occupy it, the people that come after. 
And so it's, I think it's shifting, but it's not quite there. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I think now the, the new sustainability, if you will, is the number of designers who are having some pushback against going towards net zero design or understanding that we, you know, we, need, we don't just need to be less bad. We actually need to be good. And so it's kind of <laughs> a, how do we, how do we keep pushing that conversation? And part of that talk is really making sure that we are bringing heritage and existing and historic buildings into that conversation. Um, because there's no way that we're going to build new and build our way out of the climate crisis that we're in. And so one of the groups that I'm a co-chair of is the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration. Um, and so there's four co-chairs and we're working internationally, working with also, it's kind of, it was founded by members of APT, AIA, Architecture 2030, ICOMOS, and RA, RAIC in Canada. And so we're doing some work with the Climate Heritage Network, Carbon Leadership Forum. So there's so many different organizations that to some extent are working in silos and mm -hmm. kind of around sustainability, around heritage, around carbon. So we're really trying to bring all of these organizations together so we can really push that conversation forward. Uh, Cause there's no way that existing and historic buildings cannot be part of the conversation. But that might be a double negative, but they need to be included <laughs> like, we, in order for us to move forward and address climate action. Indeed, uh, and we could we could probably do another two hours following that path. But I'm reminding myself that this is an event of our new civil rights preservation uh, conference uh, center. We should um, we should maybe um, pivot back to that um, with you know with still in my ears your great uh, expression that like we not only need you said about sustainability we not only need to be less bad we actually need to be good. Right. That that I think would be good advice for many of us who are working in the space uh, of uh, civil rights heritage and mm -hmm. heritage of the Black experience in America. Um, mm -hmm. um, and as we as we as we understand the need to center more on and to to you know to treat with it with new levels of seriousness and dedication some of the issues attached to those those experiences. That that strikes me as really good advice. Along those lines, I, I would I'd now like to um, enable you to do your slide share and to talk oh, about sure. these two um, quite amazing projects, quite quite different and quite amazing projects um, that are really dead center on this on notions of civil rights heritage and and black experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Bear with me just one second, um, and let me make that bigger. Oh, hang on, it's thinking. You can do it. Um, <laughs> All right, are you able to see the screen? Is Minokin on there? Yes, looks great. great. Okay. All right, so um, Minokin is um, one of the first projects that um, I started on at my former company. Um, and so uh, my former business partner, he had already kind of secured the contract for Minokin. And so when we started a new company, we were able to do the historic structures report for it. Um, for those of you who don't know what Minokin is, I encourage you to go to their website. Um, this was the, the video for the marketing, which I'm not going to play, but you can watch it on YouTube. Um, but their tagline of the most engaging preservation project in America, you know, they're trying to raise money, not trying to be humble. Um, but the, the story to Minokin is fascinating. And so when we approached this, it was a, we were coming to, to be the historic architect. So our job was to prepare the existing ruins to receive the steel and glass armature that was going to be uh, designed. Um, it's a multidisciplinary team led by Machado Civetti out of Boston. Uh, John Fiddler from California is also consulting on it. And there's a whole slew of uh, team members. Uh, Encore Sustainable Architects is the main historical architect now of record. Um, so anyway, so Minokin was the home to Francis Lightfoot Lee. He was one of the Virginia, Virginia signers of the Declaration of Independence and his wife, Rebecca Taylor. Um, and so it was a plantation, it was their home. And um, it was fascinating for me to go and learn all about this building uh, as a black woman and a preservationist. Cause on the one hand, I was really excited about the stones and nerding out over all of just the historic fabric that was left from the late 1700s. And then also as a black American walking onto the site and recognizing that this is hollow ground, it's a former plantation, a lot of atrocities happened here. Um, so kind of that tension of being a preservationist and being a black American um, was something that I had to keep working through. And it's been interesting how that's been evolving. 
Uh, last summer, I had the opportunity to go and have a dialogue with Bo Taylor, who is one of the descendants of the Minoke, of the Taylor family. Um, not his his uh, ancestors didn't directly live in Minokan, but anyways, it was an interesting conversation. Of uh, my my family used to be slaves at some point in time. His family owned slaves at some point in time, so we had a interesting conversation there. Um, so on the preservation side, so for a little bit, I'm going to focus just on the historic fabric and we're going to nerd out preservation style for a little bit. Um, so this building has had all of these things done to it, just about every single preservation tool that exists in the arsenal of our toolkit has been used on this particular building, from laser scans to Habs drawings, archaeology, all there. Um, so in the early 20th century, there are a number of pictograms and different photographs that have happened of the building. So there's really great documentation of what the building used to look like, how it's evolved over time, and what it needs to be. Uh, there were Habs drawings done in the 30s, both on the exterior and the interior. So we have really great documentation of what the interior millwork looked like. Um, most of the millwork was actually preserved because in the 60s, the Omahandro family uh, removed all of the millwork from the house and they donated it to the Virginia Museum in Richmond. So the millwork from Minokan was actually on display in the museum for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so they finally actually got it back from the museum. They're going to reinstall it in the new building once it's or in the renovated building once it's all done. Um, but in the 60s, um, a tree fell on it. And so this is what it looked like in the 60s. And then by the 2000s, the conservation work had been starting. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, Quinn Evans, the DC office at the time, they were the architect of record that got the shed installed over it to keep the weather out. Um, and so there's been a long line of professionals and firms that have worked on this building as the foundation changed and board shifted. So it's been an, a long line of firms. Um, and so the great thing about it is that Yes, the tree fell on it, but the woodwork was preserved in the museum and um, they have all the stones. Uh, in the top left, you see one where that's where the Monokan house is and where it says two in the bottom right, that's the stone yard. And all of the stones that have been documented um, from where, where they fell when they were found and excavated. So the downside is that they got to put all the stones back together. So they have the stones, but this is what they look like. Uh, and so our task was to go through and figure out how do we sift through these stones, categorize them, and figure out what stones are good to go back into the building. Uh, the stone groupings that we found could be seen as some of them were dressed stones, so the ones that were actually already cut. Some of them were more rubble, like in the bottom, um, the bottom right, so those were like one and two handers, meaning you could pick them up with one or two hands, and they were just kind of thrown together in rubble stone, and then there were just a number of pallets throughout the field, or throughout the stone yard. And so uh, we did end up having a, um, we ran, I ran an internship program with three preservation students um, from different universities around Virginia uh, and also one from SCAD so that they could actually go and help us find the stones. And so then we had to find the stones, categorize them, photograph them. And then also we decided to actually print the Habs drawings one-to-one. -one. Thankfully, thankfully Minokin's not a giant building. It's like 40 by 40 per facade. So we were able to print the Habs drawings full scale and then we were actually were relaying the stones back where we thought that they would go on the on the facade. So think of it like um, a big jigsaw puzzle that we were then using the Habs drawings and the actual physical stones of the building to put together because ultimately these buildings have to then go vertically back into the physical building itself. Uh, and the bottom right is the three interns that we hired. Um, the, on the bottom left, that was the day when the Habs drawings or the scrims got delivered. So the students were very excited for this FedEx truck. Um, and so Minokin's in Warsaw, Virginia. So it's very remote, very, um, very isolated. So a big truck like that was exciting for that day. Um, so anyway, so for the Habs drawings, uh, so the building also got laser scanned. So top left is what the Habs drawings look like. And the top right is actually the laser scanning of what was left over. And then the bottom is kind of showing the point clouds and we were actually able to navigate within the building to see better details of what was happening. But being able to use the historic technology and the new technology to figure out how to make it all go back together was the point of the project because we needed to be able to tell the architects in Boston where the stones that we found would actually needed to go into the building and what else needed to be replaced because we knew that not all the stones were going to go back and then we also needed to help them understand 
where the glass was going to go. So it was a really interesting project of dealing with the historic fabric, dealing with the different technologies, figuring out how to put the pieces back together and understanding what was missing, where the gaps were, how do we actually keep it in context. But one of the things that I appreciated the most about working with the Minokan Foundation is that they were already acknowledging the fact that Minokan was a plantation. So I didn't have to be the Black preservation professional coming to the site as a relatively young professional and saying, hey, by the way, you're not talking about the fact that white people enslaved Black people here. Like, can we have that conversation? Um, and so along with the work that the Minokan Foundation is doing on the historic fabric of the building, they're also doing work with some of the descendants of those who were enslaved at Minokan. And they're being very transparent and very um, vis visual about it. So I grabbed this uh, remembrance mission from their website last night. Um, so they're very clear that they are acknowledging what happened here. They are trying to continue to tell that story and to make sure that those who were enslaved here are part of the story going forward. And so that's one of the things that I think preservation as a field is trying to get better at, acknowledging the fact that there are multiple different narratives and stories and histories that have happened on different sites and that we don't just need to keep centering straight white male narratives. Um, and so I was thinking about this last night and realizing that for a long time, it's, we've kind of been treating preservation um, kind of like the way in historic photographs, you're only paying attention to the people who are in the photograph, not the photographer who actually took the picture. So it's one of those things where I think for so long, we've been focusing just on the people in the picture and not paying attention to who's behind the camera and who's actually was there and has more story to tell and could add more to that narrative. Um, so that's Minokan in a very quick nutshell. Um, but it's, it's a great project that I know they're still fundraising for, still working on. Um, and I'm not part of this project team anymore, but it was great to work on it when I did work on it a couple of years ago. And so, that's Minokin. So that's, um, you know, a very different project than I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> so switching gears and moving up a couple centuries. Um, so um, another project that I worked on was the African American Civil Rights Sites Movement in the 20th century, specifically in Washington, D.C. So for this one, um, I was teamed with Sarah Schoenfeld of Prologue, D.C., and we did this through a grant through from the DC Preservation League. And so our charge was to identify various sites in the District of Columbia, uh, specifically that impacted the civil rights movement. And so we had to start by even just identifying the criteria and identifying the period of significance and what we were looking at. Um, and so we were really looking at civil rights sites um, that were guaranteed by the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments um, and granting full and equal citizenship to African-Americans. And so um, the period of significance of this was 1912 all the way through 1974. And we made an effort to make sure that we were going to separate civil rights sites from uh, the black power movement. Um, and so it was interesting because my role on this was more so of the architect looking at the architectural significance and integrity and description of the different sites that were identified. Um, Sarah and the prologue team, they were more on, they did the historian piece of it. They wrote the majority of the nomination and it was amazing. And I was, I learned a tremendous amount from them but I also felt very much like an architectural jock because Sarah was doing this really beautiful and pithy, like here's the research, here's how all the things connected, here's DC home rule and NAACP and all of these things. And I was kind of coming in and being like, that's a brick building. <laughs> <laughs> and that building has coins. So it was one of those things where it was great to see the different spectrum of the preservation field and how there's different strengths and different options. So um, if there are students who are more interested in the history side versus the built environment side versus the conservation science side, there's, there's space for all of us in this field, which is one of the reasons why I love it. Um, so as I mentioned, there's also the uh, Black Power map, which uh, Derek Musgrove was working on. Uh, and so I believe if you go through uh, the DC Preservation League's site, you'll find links to all of these things. Uh, but one of the things that we found really interesting was that there is such a, um, a mixture and a diverse range of building types. Um, in addition to the multiple property documentation that we were doing for the National Register, um, Sarah and Pearl Law DC had also done the 20th century African American Civil Rights Tour, which also highlighted a couple of different um, sites around the city. And so the fascinating piece for this was that 
it's very different from doing the tour to doing the National Register nomination because as many people may know, the National Register and National Park Service has many uh, prescriptive guidelines that you have to follow. There, there's a framework that needs to be maintained. And so as we were going through this and identifying sites, a lot of the issues that we were running into we're like, well, how, does this qualify? Because ultimately we're focusing on buildings, not um, landscapes where it has to, it had to be a building, it had to have integrity. And that's where we started um, having some caveats and some issues where we had to push back a little bit against um, the issue of integrity, particularly architectural integrity in a city where there was heavy disinvestment in predominantly black areas. And so how do we as preservationists then reconcile the fact that we're saying, yes, something important happened in this site, but since this area was disinvested in and the architectural integrity isn't there, we can't then list it on the National Register of Historic Places. So recognizing that that was a deeper conversation that we needed to have, we've been talking with the DC SHPO and we'll see how that goes. Um, and so all that to say, um, some of the project themes that we had to look at included those listed on the screen. So from education to public accommodations to policing. Um, and then we also categorized the different property types into mainly three categories. So was it a strategy center where people were gathering, they were organizing? Um, was it a conflict center? Was there some a, a site where there was either suppression of civil rights or protests that happened? Or was it something that was associated with a key individual? Um, and so the range of sites went from schools to churches to individual houses. And there wasn't one um, stylistic type that we could say, oh, okay, all civil rights things, everything that happened with civil rights only happened in this type of building. That wasn't the case in what we found in our documentation. Um, and so we ended up finding about 130 sites. But then we also recognize that this is really just the beginnings of a framework. It is not the end all be all of all of the research. So we really wanted to set it up as a way that we can communicate the research that we found so far and allow future researchers to also use it as a way to add on to it and keep researching. And so um, we found that there were some non-extant sites. So we also included those in our database, which I think is the next one, it'll come up. Um, but we wanted to, be able to build something that people can use in the future. And so looking at the integrity, I'm oh, sorry, uh, looking at the integrity was something that we then struggled a little bit with. And as I mentioned, um, and so we're still trying to look through that. Um, and one of the things, hang on, one of the quotes I wanted to read from, um, this is from Stephanie Weiberg Webster from um, a, the Preservation and Social Inclusion book. It said, architecture and integrity are often the gateways to preservation protections and benefits but in marginalized communities, they are an excuse for exclusion. And so that was something that I had in my mind as we were going through this, because in a number of areas, we have uh, windshield surveys and then we have actual surveys. And windshield surveys tend to be places where preservationists don't feel comfortable getting out of the car. They just do a drive by real quick and say, yep, there's a historic building there. And often those are places that have been disinvested or in, in communities of color. And so then the resources get allocated differently. And we can talk about that more, but anyway, so it's things like that and really needing to challenge um, kind of the established preservation framework that existed was something that I started exploring more on this one that surprised me a little bit. Um, oh, wrong slide, sorry. Um, and so um, in terms of communicating outward, uh, we do have a public facing dashboard and then we have a database that's online so that people can see the different sites that we're looking at how they're categorized, where they are in terms of, um, are they already have historic protections? Do they not? Are they in historic districts? All of, all of the preservation-y things you would typically expect to find. And we also had individual survey um, forms for each of the sites as well. Um, and then here's a map of kind of where all the sites that we found. So you can see that it's, a, it's all over DC. It's not just concentrated in one particular area. Um, and so that was, it was a lot of documentation and connecting and thinking about how our work is going to help future researchers. And then also how do we kind of gather a lot of the work that's already been done. I think that's the last one. Yeah, so that that's my last one. And that's those two projects in a kind of a quickish nutshell. Well, that, that's it's amazing that you're able to cover two like incredibly <laughs> um, rich projects very quickly. So I appreciate you taking on the, the task of, of, of probably not talking about a lot of really important stuff, stuff that's really important to you. 
they each one of them obviously we could talk about for quite a long time i i would i'd would like to pick up on the some of the connections between them sure um one just to acknowledge that what you already acknowledged but i think as a as a you know just a, a lesson for all of us or a, a, a an inspiration for all of us to uh to, to take our our work as a in preservation whether it's highly technical whether it is nose in the archives whether it is on the street as you know um, and getting out, I love the, the idea of like, you know, get out the you know, windshield, get, be, get out from behind the windshield. Right. Um, you know, in each of those orientations to a project, um, we also bring our identities. And you, you, you spoke very eloquently about your identity as a, as a black woman architect preservationist um, mm -hmm. being part of Minokin. The, the video, I, I recommend to all of you watch the video. It's only like six minutes, but I, I, I wanna see the hour long version too. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's really um, profound and uh, in, in a, uh, it's profound period. Uh, and I think, you know, the, uh, the idea of the DC project, like also tapping into not only your own experiences, but needing to tap into the experiences of so many other people in order to represent all the, that geography of mm -hmm. how the civil rights movement shaped DC and how DC shaped the civil rights movement, right. um, that I think is, you know, it's not something we can appreciate only as historians, or as you pointed out, only as uh, an architectural preservationist looking at um, material and style and period and, and designer. So I think there, there's so much uh, to inspire us personally. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I want to ask you to reflect on that unless you, you want to. I, I, I would like to ask you to, to reflect more on this, this issue of integrity. Uh, because it is one of the both one of the canons of our field mm -hmm. and also one of the bugaboos uh, that yeah. you know it's it plagues us in a certain way um, and, and you've I think bro both projects break it open um, in, in really productive ways um, so I, I'd, I'd love to just hear you uh, riff on how integrity came into play in both projects at greater length but also that uh, how you, I, I want really want to know how you see our use of integrity changing um, and, and in particular in the hands of regulators who, who have a difficult job um, and have a lot of incentives to stick with the way that integrity has been interpreted in a long time. So how does the DC SHPO reuse integrity to, to purposes that really meet the, these kinds of projects? Right, well, that's a, that's a great question. It's a big one, um, but it's one of those, it's interesting because I feel like until I started working on the uh, DC Civil Rights Project, I hadn't, questioned it that much because it's one of those things where I was like this is what it is because I done I had previously done a number of historic tax credit projects uh, for private developers where it's you know the building has to be on the national register or at least eligible to be on the national register and then there's funding that can be associated and that kind of thing and it wasn't really until this project where I started thinking about oh wait a second how what's the what is the national register made up of and recognizing then that oh there's only I think two percent of the registers um, is, is recognizing buildings to African-American heritage. And then kind of thinking, then of course, um, last summer I ended up reading uh, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, which was another like eye-opening, mind-shattering, anger-inducing, like how did this not, how did I not know this? Um, but kind of understanding how integrity, ownership, um, what's, what's listed, what's not listed, what gets tax credits, what doesn't, what gets disinvested in, what doesn't, and who is there, and the stories that all of the economics of preservation tell. Um, I know that um, that Claire, Caroline Chung, who's another UPenn alum, um, and Donna Mrikma, I know that they, present place economics has been doing a lot of these studies on preservation and gentrification. And there's, I think there's just so much there in terms of integrity and the stories that we're telling, with, particularly when we're only looking at the built environment. And so I don't know where it's going. I'm hoping that we'll continue to have conversations to find our own biases and to have a better understanding of what are we saying when only buildings that are eligible for the National Register are able to receive historic tax credits, particularly mm -hmm. if we know that we're not allowing certain types of buildings, particular vernacular buildings, to be listed on the register and what does that mean? So kind of a, an understanding of the equity and inequity that exists within the funding system. Um, and yeah, and the regulators, I, they, I know they have a hard job in changing legislation. 
is a struggle and trying to figure out what is the new legislation even mean? What could that look like? What would be more equitable instead of integrity and all of those kinds of conversations. So I'm still learning about a lot of this myself, um, but it is, I think a first step just even acknowledging and learning kind of the, oh, there's, there's things there that I don't know that I need to pay more attention to even getting more into redlining and actually sidebar. Um, one of the projects that we're working on at Quinn Evans, um, I can talk about this. Yeah, I can talk about this. Um, <laughs> just checking. It's, it's new. It's starting soon. Um, but in our, it's a, it's a school renovation in a historically black area um, that was actually redlined. And so knowing that um, school funding is tied heavily to residential tax bases, and recognizing the fact that this area had been redlined, so there were less resources going to the school and how that impacted the shape of the school, what was there, what was allowed, and actually having that conversation with the decision makers in the proposal process um, really helped our team stand apart because we were recognizing the fact that we can't tell the story of this community without telling the story of redlining and the impacts that that had on the area and you know, earning potential and all of all of the um, the chain of things that happened from that. Um, a, a, a challenge well put. Uh, we, we were all on a, on a steep learning curve, I think, these days in scholarship like Rothstein's uh, and the, the scholarship that his book was based on, uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor's um, recent mm -hmm. book about housing finance and, uh, and uh, housing policy, also just, you know, really kind of mind blowing and embarrassing, frankly. Um, those, those raise, I think, a really, um, acute issue for preservation um, that that rings the bell of integrity once again. Like, mm -hmm. So if these laws or decisions about housing policy or sites of protest where the protest is long since gone, but and the site is just like the sidewalk or the street or a, a building that's missing, um, these are all forms of heritage, I would argue. Um, and one of the, this is actually one of the issues that the Civil Rights Center is, is trying to, to, to pursue. How do we think about um, alternative forms of heritage that, that don't take on the same uh, aspects of property that, that we're used to regulating? Uh, and so if we think about events or laws, um, even, you know, kind of, uh, if, you know, any, anything, any kind of non-property aspect of heritage, how do we bring it into the framework where it gets the kind of um, you know, public mandate, public support, even public funds uh, to remember, um, to represent um, uh, in, a, in a way that is, I'm not saying equivalent, but uh, connected to the same kind of you know, strong legal basis that's grown up for, uh, for, for regulating historic properties. And I think right. we use the word property as a, just kind of a throwaway because we're used to it, but there's so much um, there's so much history in that, that notion of property that we ignore. Um, I, I, I do think that that's one of the ways we need to open up, maybe, maybe integrity is the tool that we use to open up this, you know, this problem of property. Yeah, I mean, I think and it's also, as you're saying that, it, might, um, it reminds me of a conference I went to where it, there was a developer of augmented reality glass, glasses there. And um, he was more so for like, if you would use them to like look at a piece of artwork. Uh, but one of the things he was talking about was the fact that preservationists and cultural resource specialists need to make sure that we are in the AR or the augmented reality conversation, because we need to make sure that we're there telling and developing the AI, developing the code to help, um, to help identify what needs to be remembered. Because if we're not at the table when all of the technology is being developed, then there's a large swath of history that's going to get missed because if we're only getting, if only the textbook history is the history that's being put into the Iron Man type, augmented reality, whatever, then we're going to lose a lot of history of what's already there. And so yeah. I thought it was interesting, an interesting way of connecting different professions. And as you're talking about property and integrity, you know, what if the future is, you know, you're able to press a button and you can go back in a timeline to see what existed on this particular piece of land, you know, 10, 20, 100 years ago. I don't know. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that all develops. That'd be a good way to start a debate at a cocktail party of preservationists, you know, the, <laughs> who's going to sign up for the degree in auto, um, augmented reality. Exactly. <laughs> As a quick aside, our, our colleagues um, here at Penn who, um, who created Monument Lab, uh, Paul Farber yeah. and Ken Lum and all their colleagues, they recently came out with an, an AR 
a monument essentially, um, or prototype of it. Um, so cool. go take a look at that and, and okay. we, then we can continue debating. Uh, so one, one more the detailed question along this line about the, the DC survey project. Um, you mentioned having to use the, the, the usual seven aspects of integrity as, as filters um, with D, the DC SHPO. And it sounds like there's, there's some continuing back and forth about that. Were there sites or, or forms of heritage or heritage places, I don't know what to call them, that you let purposefully left out of that survey because you were sure that, that they, they ran too far afoul of that traditional property-centered notion of integrity? So there, there were originally, but then we decided we were putting them all in. So we decided we were putting them all in and then within the narrative, we put a caveat about why we did what we did in terms of integrity, because we didn't feel like we could make the distinction to say that because um, this area was disinvested in the past and it's no longer eligible. So it's one of those things where we purposely left it there so we could have that conversation um, and then um, realizing that the multiple property document, that's kind of all the sites to be considered. But then we did end up also doing two nominations to the DC register of buildings that will also then be nominated to the national register. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the way that we walked that line where it's like, okay, well, hey, here are these two buildings that are clearly eligible for the national register. And we would put these up for nomination, but then also here's the whole swath of buildings that we think still need to be considered included, considered, or at least leave breadcrumbs for future historians to then go back to and keep finding. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, so um, again, we could talk about integrity for another couple hours. Uh, if we you know, left and got ourselves some, uh, some cocktails to come back with, especially. Uh, right. But, and I wanted to, I have one eye on the clock and it's, we're already about 6.45. There's one other question, different question that I wanted to ask you. Um, but before doing that, I just wanted to remind uh, everyone who's listening, watching, um, think of your questions, please put them in the, in the Q&A. Um, so, so we've got um, some ready to uh, when we get to, to the Q&A period in a few minutes. Um, uh, can I also ask uh, my colleague, Sarah Lerner, who I'm, I know is, uh, is manning the controls, um, if you could put the, uh, the, um, the links to both the, the DC survey um, and, and the Minokan, um, that Minokan video um, in, the, in the chat, that would be helpful too, because I would like everybody to be able to follow up on all these things. Um, so the, the other thing that you've been spending all of your free time on um, over the last, uh, well, you, you tell us how long you've been working on it, um, is this really fantastic podcast called Tangible Remnants, um, which um, you know, I, I also want to hear about how you came up with the name or how, how you decided on this name, probably among lots of others. Right. Um, but if you could just tell us about Tangible Remnants and about why you decided to spend some of your, um, your, your dear yeah. time um, working on this as part of, part, of your, part of your professional work. Yeah, absolutely. So this was a uh, pandemic project. Um, it was one of those feeling uh, lots of frustration and rage, particularly when, um, so after the murder of George Floyd, so on the one hand, I was excited that there were so many of uh, my white colleagues who were like, oh my goodness, this is a problem, we need to talk about it. Well, I was excited for that. I was also very frustrated because it's like, this wasn't the first time that this has happened. Um, this has been a problem for decades, but I was, you know, I was grateful that they were, and it's like, welcome to the conversation. Okay, let's keep going. Um, but then it was also a realizing that there aren't that many people um, in my vantage point in the sense where, um, of the 100,000 licensed architects in the US, there are 500-ish Black women. Um, so it's, you know, there's not many Black women architects that are licensed. Um, there's not many Black profession, not many Black historic prof preservation professionals. Um, and actually, I ended up um, helping advise on the starting of the Black and Historic Preservation Directory to try and find more Black preservationists around the country uh, with Kennedy Whiters. And so then also it was one of those like just needing to talk. And so I was, <laughs> for the first couple of episodes, it's just kind of me talking in my closet by myself. <laughs> um, but it was just really wanting to share more of my viewpoint of, of both and. Um, and I really do just see that architecture, preservation, sustainability, race, gender, they're all related. Um, and so it was, it's been fun kind of exploring some of that. 
And the name Tangible Remnants actually came out from a conversation I was having with my husband and thinking about the fact that a lot of times the, the myth of white supremacy is that, oh, well, only uh, straight white males have done anything in this country and everyone else, you just be grateful that you're here. And if you don't like it, you can leave. And it's like, well, that's, that's not the case. Like there have been many groups that have contributed to the story of this country. And it's been, we've, there've been, there are tangible remnants of those stories that have been left behind around across the centuries. And so I really see preservation as a way of remembering and telling the stories of all the people who've come before us from mm. multiple different backgrounds. Um, and so then having a conversation with my husband, coming back from Minokin and really thinking about, you know, standing in the Minokin, touching the stone from 300 years ago and feeling a tangible remnant of someone who was there, who put the horse hair and the plaster and all of those things is kind of where the name came from. And uh, just realizing that preservation has power to tell the story of those who've always been here uh, that can help dispel some of the myths that we've been dealing with as uh, social justice and racial equity is coming up more. Well, uh, thank you for, for figuring out a way to, um, to, to make your, your, your own thought process transparent and for, for sharing it in a way that is, uh, you know, so easily, um, easily consumed and, and uh, by all of us and, uh, and, you know, used to challenge our own ways of thinking and what we're doing and what we're not doing. Um, this is, uh, you know, it, I, I, I've enjoyed every, every episode, you know, keep going, go faster, uh, you know, get, get back in your closet, I guess is the, you know, te technically what, where, where you need to go. Uh, but seriously, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a one, it's not just a pandemic project. I think that kind of undersells it. I think it's a really important contribution as part of your larger work um, uh, uh, that, that is, I think, really um, has the, has great potential to change the way that the field works. Um, which is why we need to change the way that preservationists think, right? Because, you know, us thinking things is maybe good for us, um, but we're only going to really change how we, um, how we benefit society by changing the field. So, you know, that integrity concept is not just a cocktail party debate um, that has some, some real impact on, on how we can, um, you know, shape, shape those built environments. Um, so, uh, I, I don't want to exhaust you by, by piling on more questions, uh, which I, I would be happy to do, but I, we do have at least one question in the queue. Sure. So I'll, I would like to, you know, kind of pivot to that if, um, if sure. we can. Um, and uh, let's see, the first question, uh, it's from Caitlin Meaves. Thank you. Um, could you repeat the source of the quote about integrity, uh, how it's been used as a barrier to keep diverse histories and stories out of the National Register? It perfectly articulated the integrity struggle I've been having in my work. Yes. Um, so that was from, um, oh, hang on one second, let me go back. So it was Stephanie Weiberg Webster. Um, let me make sure that I got that right. Um, and it's from the uh, Preservation and Social Justice. Sorry, I'm looking around for the book. It's the blue book that <laughs> um, came out of the Columbia Conference two years ago. There's a blue book and a green book. Yeah, Erica and, Avrami is the yes. editor. Yes. But uh, so you, you may remember that Steph Ryberg was a PhD student at Penn when you were there. What? Oh. She was. You guys, you guys were in the same hallways, but of course, you know, yeah, uh, she, yeah, she uh, got her PhD probably about the same time you graduated and has published uh, some amazing stuff on community development and preservation, the connections between them. Cool. And she teaches at Cleveland State. Um, and I don't think she's in, the, if she's in the crowd, she should step forward. Um, I, don't, I don't see <laughs> Steph on the list. Um, but uh, any other questions, you know, please, uh, please do uh, pipe in. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, Nikita, some of the projects that you're looking to next. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't ask you to reveal all those proposals that you've heard that, you know, you've heard that you'll have a contract, but you don't have the contract yet. Um, but, you know, let me ask you a more kind of uh, speculative question. Like if you could create a project mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that, you know, get somebody to spend some money on a project that you wanted to do that you would, could formulate, like what kind of project would that be? Yeah. So that would be um, a renovating a vacant school into affordable housing that is net zero um, and probably would serve seniors. Um, and so what, one of the things that I've been surprised by, particularly in cities like Detroit and even some cities in Baltimore or like Baltimore, where it's just the size of the buildings and, and I just don't understand why we have vacant buildings and homeless people in the same city. And so that's always been something that has been 
a kind of a, a disconnect for me. And so I would love for there to be more housing created there more with wraparound services so that there weren't there weren't having to be people on the streets um, so that we can actually take better care of our citizens. And I think that preservation and architecture and development and real estate, there's a, there's a connection there in a, in a way that could be designed and constructed so that um, it's sustainably done. People aren't inhaling toxins and all of that kind of stuff. I've also been recently learning more about the lead problem in Baltimore and some other cities mm -hmm. and the connection of um, a lot of the, the shooters uh, and some of the violent crime in Baltimore grew up in housing projects that were known to have lead poisoning. So recognizing that lead wow. poisoning impacts childhood development, brain development, and then knowing that then those children grow up and then have stress issues. And then so it's like the fact that design in the built environment can really impact people in a way that then impacts society even more directly um, is something that I I think just we just need to be more mindful of and keep exploring. Yeah, we um, um, we recently uh, did a survey um, of the preservation field um, that I think you, you were helpful in doing it, vetting an early version of it. Uh, we've got the data for it. And we're, we're processing and analyzing the data now. But one of the sets of questions we asked was about how people perceive how people in the preservation field perceive the connections between historic preservation and public health. Um, and it was, you know, it, it's it, frankly a weaker connection um, than we we had hoped. Um, mm -hmm. But I think stories or or analysis like the one you just presented uh, is, you know, I think would would draw people's attention for sure. So yeah, um, uh, thanks thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, uh, uh, Pamela, I, I, your your talk about um, in talking about schools um, that taps into some of the things we've been doing in our preservation studios in the last few years. As, as fate would have it in Detroit, um, as well as in Philly. Mm -hmm. And in those two cities, the, the issues of abandoned schools or disused schools um, is, you know, is, is pretty um, stark and kind of heartbreaking. We did a, a really cool um, pandemic era short studio project virtually with colleagues in Detroit where they gave us uh, virtual tours of some of these abandoned schools and students did these really thoughtful Kind of two or three week long projects about reuse, um, uh, but uh, you know I think the issue remains that um, not only are these you know that the, the buildings have been um, you know left for so long that it's it's more and more difficult to to bring them back to any working condition, but in many cases the the, the communities of which they are part um, no longer have integrity one might say, right. um, so that's you know the, the the push and pull between those two issues is really uh, tough. Um, but my colleague, Pamela Hawks, with whom I've done those studios, asked a question. Um, Thanks for such a thoughtful presentation. Three cheers for preservation architecture and both and. Uh, and, and she asked, could you repeat the name of the Sustainability Preservation Coalition that you yeah. mentioned early on? Yes, so it is the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration, or the ZNCC. Um, and I think the website's like ZNCC or ZNCCollaboration.org or something along those lines. Um, and so um, that's been really fun getting more involved um, both internationally and kind of seeing how this all connects. Uh, so uh, Mark Brandt out of Canada, as well as Peter Cox over in Ireland. And so we have some, some people all over the world. So it's been, oh, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, that's it. She just put it in the chat. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for covering us. Uh, <laughs> And um, uh, my other colleague, Kesha Fong, uh, just asked a question about, um, back to the integrity issue, uh, what were your criteria for including no longer extant sites uh, on the DC civil rights inventory? So for those ones, um, if we had newspaper articles or other sort of documentation that talked about what happened at that particular site. Um, and so for those ones we had, they're included in the database, but they are separate. So we don't have extant and non-extant sites in the same list, if you will, they're two separate things. Uh, but we did still wanna include them because even though they may not exist anymore, they were still part of the civil rights narrative and the story. And so that was also the piece where it's like, all right, well, this narrative is bigger than just the buildings, but we still have to make sure we're focusing on the existing buildings that have integrity. So it was, it was a lot of negotiating and it kind of at times felt like we were trying to uh, go over the trip, the tripwire, like navigating lasers in a museum or something like that. Like it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of negotiation. Well, uh, let's look forward to a day in the future where we, we don't have to create separate lists right. um, that we can talk about heritage and especially the heritage of difficult and 
you know, um, less visible histories like um, Black experience of civil rights or um, not to mention, you know, sites of protest and violence. Um, right. And we can talk about them as, as if they were one experience and, uh, and preserve them, um, preserve them with all of our, uh, all of our attention. Um, so with that, um, we're, we're basically at an hour, uh, and I, I'm going to check one more time to see if there's, we've, uh, we've answered the questions that have come up. Um, so I, I just uh, want to, um, number one, thank you again for taking the time to make the preparation and, and to, to join us tonight, uh, Nikita. And also thanks for, for all that you're going to do next, um, because your work is really, I think, leading the way in a lot of regards. Um, and I hope that um, everyone else on the on the call um, joins me in making sure that we uh, not only listen into tangible remnants, but uh, but to uh, keep an eye on on what you do next. And uh, thanks for all of your great work. And uh, thanks for joining us. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. It really is an honor. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Nikita. Thanks everyone for joining us. Bye, guys.